we always say we have an all-star panel, uh, but this time we really do. Um, uh, or I guess I should say it's a Hall of Fame panel, since we always say all-star. Uh, and not only do they not need any introduction, they've actually already been introduced today, so I'll just dispense uh, with that part. So let's go straight to the uh, first question. Uh, and the question I want to ask is, uh, looking back uh, with you know, 10 years of perspective, what would you have done differently uh, in the case? What's your biggest uh, uh, regret? And I guess for Keith, the version of that question will be, what, what should Microsoft have done differently uh, in this litigation since you've taken a pro-Microsoft stance in uh, your articles? Uh, so why don't we start actually with uh, Doug? Flawless. I can't think of anything. No, that I should start. That's not an acceptable answer. That you did everything right um, in this kind of case. Boy, I, I wish you'd. I wish you'd sent me that question in advance. Um, uh, I wasn't happy with uh, what happened after the D.C. Circuit decision. That wasn't on my watch. Not so much, by the way, because and we'll get to this. I hope, because I think I think the remedy was. Um, uh, weaker than it should have been, but because I thought it was n the articulation of what the case was about uh, was not accurate and not constructive. Um, but in terms of what happened before then, uh, uh, I wish we hadn't brought the uh, the, the so-called contempt proceeding. I think that was that proved to be kind of a, a, a pointless fire drill in a sense. Um, let me think. I don't know. I'll pass on this one. Can I, let me come back. So, well, let me uh, follow up. Yeah. So, no regrets about having the remedy decided uh, in oh, such a oh short yes, of course. Of time? How could I forget that? You mean you mean the the the, the, the divestiture remedy? Yeah. yeah. Oh yes, that was a disgrace. I mean, I mean, for the judge to order divestiture without without a hearing was a disgrace, in my view. And. Um, and uh, I guess there are limits as to what I can say about internal discussions, but suffice to say that there were, there were some people, uh, and I will say that I was one of them, who, 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 who thought it was just simply indefensible, and that we shouldn't have, we should have um, uh, perhaps made an effort to undo that. Um, uh, for two reasons. One, because it would have been irresponsible to have such a remedy without, without a hearing to determine whether the costs were uh, vastly greater than the government alleged them to be. Um, and second, because uh, keeping that record the way it was, uh, I think did, uh, or, or at least potentially jeopardized the liability determination. I mean, the Court of Appeals, I think, was remarkably statesmanlike. They could have reversed the whole thing based on the, uh, uh, not analytically, but they could have inferred from the remedy, coupled with Judge Jackson speaking to the press, that there was something really wrong with the whole damn process. Uh, and they could have uh, that could have motivated them to reverse, uh, uh, you know, the, the the section two judgment. So that was a, uh, a, a certainly a risky course. But uh, the court of appeals didn't do that. So ultimately, there was no harm, it seems to me, from from that. So Brad, what do you think uh, Microsoft's biggest missed uh, chance was? Well, it, I, it's. It's not easy and it's not necessarily fair to sit 10 years later and second guess decisions that people made. Um, even though I'll confess that when I was listening to David Boyes this afternoon, I did on one occasion ask myself, I wonder how our case would have gone if he had been our lawyer. Um, so <laughs> so that one can ask things like that. Um, I do wish in some ways that when the uh, negotiations accelerated in 2001, um, there might have been an opportunity to include the European Commission uh, in that process. Uh, when we had had issues arise uh, in 1994, uh, there was a tripartite discussion or negotiation, if you will, between the Department of Justice and the European Commission and Microsoft. And uh, as a result, we were able to resolve issues on two continents in a unified and consistent way simultaneously. Um, and you know, the, the discussions were already quite complicated, uh, and it's therefore easy to understand at one level um, why the Europeans um, were not at the table. Um, but if they had been, um, it might, who knows, uh, have been possible to uh, work things out in a, a more global manner than proved to be the case. Was there actually talk at the time of them possibly getting involved in a global settlement? 
There, there was some discussion, but um, you know, an invitation was never um, requested nor issued um, by any of the governments that were involved. Um, and I think, it, among other things, there was just probably uh, an appreciation that it was quite a complicated process, as I think David mentioned before. It was there have been seven rounds of discussions, perhaps, at various times. So one can readily appreciate why people would conclude um, that if one had the chance to get something done on one continent, it made sense to, to seize that opportunity and, and accomplish it. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, more generally, um, you know, we were very supportive in, in 1994 of the concept of trying to bring together governments from both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, felt that it had been a beneficial process. Uh, and in general, uh, I personally think that we just need more opportunities for transatlantic uh, coordination on some of these matters. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Mike. thanks, Senator. It's a lot easier to answer that question not having been involved in the case at all. <laughs> um, the, uh, every year when I and I assume you've, Einer, you've had the same experience too. Every year you teach this case to your students. And then you get to the section where the court is going through the appellate, appellate court decision. It's going through these, these acts that are allegedly, these uh, allegedly anti-competitive acts. And the court uh, goes through and says, well, um, for this one, it's, there's an anti-competitive effect. Uh, and there's no pro-competitive pro, no pro -competitive or efficiency justification whatsoever for it. And you go through that several times, reading the opinion, and you, you end up asking yourself, how could, this ha how could this happen? How could you end up in an, appell in an appellate court and to have these serious charges, and the court is saying there's no defense whatsoever offered by the, by the defendant? And uh, I've, I've had a consultant, um, a fellow named Mike Nichols, who apparently was one of the consultants involved in the case, come in and talk about the case in my class, and I put the same question to him, and so he goes into a long argument about how the trial was conducted. But uh, so I, I imagine that whatever went wrong, you know, that was one thing that um, that I think any firm would try to avoid. And I, I certainly say that to my students that you know you're going to be out here out there practicing in a year from now, and whatever happened during the course of this trial, you you better try not to have this happen to you. End up in an appellate court decision with the court saying this about the, the uh, defendant's uh, management of its own case. Um, so I get, if there's some way, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the way that, that Judge Jackson ran the trial that somehow this happened, that there were these, uh, there, there were these charges that just weren't responded to. But uh, that leaps, off, le leaps off of the case, out of the case right away as something that looks like a glaring problem in the way, it, it, possibly a, a glaring problem in the way it was uh, conducted. Doug, you want to jump in on this? Just a, a comment on that. I mean, I wasn't uh, deeply involved in the day-to-day -day trial, but a, a different perspective on the same issue. Um, when, in the run-up to the trial, you know, we had developed a, a lot of evidence and a lot of concerns about what Microsoft was doing and theories were developing and complaints were being drafted. And, and s some of us in, in, in uh, on Joel's team you know, I had, in my case, I don't know, 20 plus years of being a defense lawyer and, you know, thinking of, 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 of uh, uh, pro-competitive uh, explanations for conduct is sort of what we do in our sleep. And, and so I was, oh, God, I, I remember these conversations, you can justify that, of course, here's how you, and uh, we went back to Microsoft a couple of times on the, on the 11th hour with, with interrogatories specifically aimed at that. Tell us what exactly the reason is you did this, or what revenues did you expect from that? And they didn't then answer those questions with uh, uh, articulating, I mean, I'm not saying 100%, but in many of them, they just did, they, they did either were not responsive or they appeared to have no uh, explanation. So I, I think, uh, uh, I infer from that, although I can't connect those specific vague recollections with what happened at the trial, that the, that the failure of Microsoft to prevail, to persuade the court that there were legitimate pro-competitive justifications for the various things that the court found to be anti-competitive did not reflect, at least generally speaking, a happenstance of the trial mm -hmm. so much as Microsoft's own perception of and, and, and ways of thinking about and explaining its conduct. Can I, can I just add one, one thing to that and then I'll, I'll shut up? Uh, 
the consultant I've, I've had in my class uh, makes it sound, you know, when I put that same question to him, he says, well, you know, some of those things weren't important, didn't seem to be important issues at all, and people really weren't paying attention to those, and then we were surprised to see this being treated as something important in the appellate court decision. Um, anyway, I don't know, you know, what, what weight to put on that answer. So, Brad, is, is this fair, the court finding that there was no pro-competitive justification whatsoever put forward? Uh, well, for what, though? I mean, there were so many issues in the yeah. case, it's a little hard to answer in the abstract. Um, yeah. I, so I actually can't answer it in the abstract. If there's a particular mm -hmm. issue well, that people remember, well, I might be able to address it. Some of them were ones that, that I could, I think, is, uh, you know, we, 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 as we, we pointed out, you could just think of them in your initial leap, what those pro-competitive justifications. So I, I assume it would not have been hard to come up with a pro-competitive justification if, if pressed on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, but I, the thing to think about is the case was about a number of specific acts. Yeah. So the question would be, well, what was the pro-competitive justification for Act Number One or Act Number Seven? Or Let's act take the integration 12? of the browser. Well, I certainly do believe that we put forth quite a vigorous uh, explanation for the uh, pro-competitive effects of the integration of the browser. I mean, basically, it was a sense that by adding this feature in the operating system you could use the code that you created to serve a wide variety of different needs. That was one point. You know, for example, you take something as simple as HTML. You know, it's supported through an HTML rendering engine. And by building this into the operating system, it not only created the ability for the computer screen to display what someone s saw when they went to a web page, but it also enabled all other software developers to use that tool as well, including for things as sort of as simple as help files, which are now routinely displayed in HTML by Microsoft Windows, its own help files, as well as most other programs that are created. You know, in addition, it's, and it really goes to the point that Dave Heiner was making this morning, the idea was to create a wide variety of, of services that could be then made available to software developers so that they wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, and you know, create you know, those pieces of code themselves. And the whole act of co-mingling, uh, I think when we look back, you know, co-mingling was an odd term. It's not a phrase that you hear software developers talk about. The notion that you could create code that would do multiple things is actually considered to be an efficiency in and of itself. The, the computer doesn't have to execute as many lines of code to, to do something. So there were, I, but I actually think that's probably an area where we did make a number of those arguments. And I think that as a result, the Court of Appeals decision was pretty limited. And what it really focused on was just the fact that there wasn't the ability to remove the code more than anything else. And so the, the lower court, though, was wrong, you think, in finding that, in fact, it worsened performance, this uh, integration. That led him, it meant that if the browser crashed or the operating system, uh, the, the finding that uh, Judge Jackson made on that. I think that we, it would be fair to say that we felt that at the time, or we would certainly say we certainly feel today, um, that you know, the integration of these various features made the operating system a more powerful tool for software developers and made the personal computer a more powerful tool for computer users. All right, so, um, so on that, you made the argument, but you just lost, basically. Uh, I, I so. think that, that at the district court, you might say we lost broadly on that point, and then at the Court of Appeals, because the tying case was reversed and remanded, you know, the actual, if you, if you look at the Court of Appeals decisions, you know, there were a number of issues on which we lost on appeal. But on this specific issue, you know, that, that this issue is narrower at the appellate level. And what about the other issues where, where there was no pro competitive justification offered for specific acts? Well, why, why was that? Well, I'm trying to, I, I, look, in the, ab in the absence of somebody saying, do you remember this issue? There was no pro-competitive sure, offering. I'll, 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 I'll do that. I'll I, do I that. have no ability to remember what we're talking about here. Brad, I'll do that for you. Um, so one of them is, uh, is you can't remove Internet Explorer from the ad remove. You can't use the ad remove port utility to take Internet Explorer off of the operating system. 
and the court looked at that and said, we can't find a pro-competitive justification for this. And also the commingling argument, they couldn't find a pro-competitive justification. Now, it strikes me as Doug was saying that, you know, we could think of one in our sleep and you offered one. And how did that happen that you end up in the appellate court? The court is saying, well, here are these things and we can't see any pro-competitive justification whatsoever. So the, where did, what happened to that justification? Was it given but just disappeared somewhere? Did it, how is it that the appellate court ends up with no evidence of a pro-competitive justification offered? Yeah, and, and I'll say, not having been part of the trial team, it's a diff difficult question for me to answer. I, I seem to recall that we may have and probably did offer a justification. Dave Heiner is likely to have more recollection of the specifics than I am on that. So, so it does go to the point about maintaining a common platform across uh, computers from different manufacturers. And the point was, if you gave OEMs the right to remove the browser, and we meant really remove the browser, actually remove the code, then when the user gets a machine from HP, it won't run the applications that were built to run on Windows. And that's the whole basis of Windows, is that it is a common platform across all the different PCs, all over the world, all the applications run, that's the business model. And that defense was in the testimony of Paul Moritz. Now, when Professor Felton, and he's got his hand up, when Professor Felton then defined the browser to mean just the appearance to the end user, all those benefits sort of flow away, you know, because the code would then remain in the system. And so for purposes of defining is the browser beneficial in the system, the browser was defined to be this little thing, which is just the appearance to the end user. But for the purposes of considering the anti-competitive effect, the platform level competition, now we're talking about Netscape as a platform versus Internet Explorer as a platform. Then the, the division sort of considered the browser to be uh, all of this code. And so it's kind of like two different definitions depending on what you were trying to achieve. I'm but sorry, that was our pro-competitive Before we get to uh, Mr. Felton's uh, response, I didn't see the efficiency justification. You said it's a common platform. Why is a common platform an efficiency? Okay, so the, the essence of a platform is the developers write code once, and then everybody can use it. That's the efficiency. So you get like, say, a 10x, a 100x, a 1,000x return on writing that code. The efficiency is demonstrated by the fact that the computer uh, industry has developed along the lines of platform software. I mean, it could be you write all the code for every single function, you know, from the application layer through right down to the metal, you know, right down to the chip. But that's not how it's done. So the efficiency is the concept of a platform. And what we were saying was, as technology develops, as the microprocessor becomes more powerful and so forth, you want to expand the capabilities of the platform. Around the mid-1990s, what developers were starting to do was work with the internet. And they were getting interested in HTML, as Brad was saying, as HTTP. And so we're saying, with respect to Windows, you can let it stagnate, and then it will still be a platform for what it does, putting a window on the screen, putting up a dialog box, but that's it. Or you can say, the direction of the industry is toward the internet, let's build in those basic technologies, most of which came from Unix, by the way, and so they weren't really in Windows, things like TCP IP. And so we built that in to expand the platform. The efficiency is, Innovation, that's why there was something called the Freedom to Innovate Network. The innovation in the platform by adding new capabilities to it and then maintaining it as a common platform so that the applications would run, and this is the essence of a platform, that it works, the applications will run on that platform on any PC. Uh, without yeah, without re-arguing the merits of this point, let me just uh, say two things. Uh, first of all, um, I think what Dave was just saying is similar to the arguments Microsoft was making at trial. And there's not, I think, in any of that a justification for code being put in the same DLL as opposed to being put in separate DLLs. Um, that is, there's not a justification here for commingling. I think much of Microsoft's argument on the tying issue um, was dependent on the idea that um, these files of code were indivisible units. And uh, given that, they didn't want to talk about an alternate world in which they were separate and to compare that world to the world that we were in. Um, and so it seemed to me that it sort of flowed from the way they argued that part of the case, that they didn't want to talk about separation of those files into pieces and whether that would be better or worse from an engineering standpoint. They more or less uh, treated it as um, 
an impossibility. Brad, you want to respond or not? No. Okay. <laughs> well, so, suppose it's right. Uh, I mean, it, you know, we can dispute whether in fact there is a good pro-competitive justification, but suppose a court has found that there is none. Uh, they, they've listened to what it's offered and think there's not really a pro-competitive justification. Um, should we just have a naked restraint rule for monopolization cases? If you've got nothing positive to say uh, that's persuasive on one side of the ledger and there's some possible anti-competitive story, why shouldn't we just condemn it summarily the way we do uh, under the you know, abbreviated rule of reason uh, in any uh, Section 1 case where there's no plausible pro-competitive justification offered? Brad, why don't you respond to that? No. Well, I, I, to be honest, my reaction is uh, a little bit of a reflection of what Doug was saying before. Given that antitrust lawyers can come up with these pro-competitive justifications in their sleep, I, I'm not sure that such a rule would have much practical effect. Um, you know, the truth is, most of the time when things are done, there's a variety of reasons that one might do them. And you know, I, I think that it's hard to avoid the necessity for courts to grapple with harder questions. And one's not likely to solve these problems by you know, being able to rely on simple solutions very often. Well, but I mean, at least if you credit what the court found in this case, it, it would be a simple solution to a lot of the conduct. And in LePage's, for that matter, very controversial case, but the court found there's no pro-competitive justification at all uh, offered, uh, and I actually see it in lots of cases where the focus is all on did we really do something bad, something anti-competitive, and very little focus on whether there's anything positive to say about the conduct. Uh, first of all, I want to say I, you should have asked that question with your hand raised because I, you know that I'm, <laughs> you and I'm discussing a case where I'm on the other side of this issue right now. Um, so it was therefore a trick question in, in, in David's sense. Um, uh, but I think the answer, and one could certainly debate this answer as a matter of antitrust policy, is that the antitrust laws um, uh, have reached a judgment that except for certain kinds of conduct, like hardcore cartel conduct, that is um, so likely to have really significant harm to competition, that we don't want to have these per se rules uh, in that, this wouldn't be a per se rule, but a, but a kind of, if there's no justification for the conduct, it's, uh, it's illegal. Uh, and it's really a belt and suspenders. It's really, a, it's another one of these false positive stories I think that Andy was talking about. The, the, the law makes a judgment that we're not so certain that we're going to get it right that this is naked conduct, that, uh, so we're not going to condemn it without requiring the plaintiff to prove another hurdle, which is that there's, you know, whatever, however you articulate the test, that there's some real nexus between that conduct and harm to competition. But it's a policy judgment. I, I think it's a logical matter. You could certainly reach, uh, reach the other result. And indeed, the Jefferson Parish per se tying rules differs from, you know, all other Section 2 type rules, it seems to me, only in this respect. It's willing to presume harm to competition, and I think it makes no sense to single out that for a, for a lenient rule, but in every other respect, we don't do that. Um, so let me switch to the other side of the coin of the regrets uh, question, which is, um, what do you think the other side should have done differently from their perspective? Not, I mean, obviously you would say they shouldn't have brought the whole case, but uh, I mean, given their goals, what do you think were their missed opportunities? What moment did you think, thank God they didn't take advantage of this opportunity uh, and do this uh, to us, uh, Brad and Doug, and then uh, uh, I, From what I've seen, I think they were pretty effective. So <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing where I can sit back and say, oh, gee, if only they had done this other thing, they would have really won the case. I think they <laughs> did just fine. Maybe they could have persuaded the judge not to talk to the press, but I don't think that was in their purview. Uh, Again, I, I, you know, the, the trial team could certainly answer in a way that I can't, uh, trial questions of trial tactics and the like. My perception, uh, mostly uh, uh, from the decision to bring the case and in the, in the run-up to that and the meetings, meetings with Microsoft and then other uh, more distant observations, was that Microsoft, for whatever reason, uh, I have my conjecture, but it's just conjecture, um, uh, uh, articulated this case at a fairly high level of generality. 
Uh, it was a case about the right to innovate. It was a case about product design. Uh, it, uh, it, it was a case about product uh, 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 innovation. Um, uh, and um, of course, they, I think, made it, made it, well, at least in hindsight, it was a tactical error, even disputing that they had monopoly power. Uh, and I think if they had looked, uh, uh, my conjecture would be that, that they would have maybe been better served if they had looked at the case at a more granular level, accepted that it was an inside baseball story. In other words, they had to join issue with the nitty gritty of just this exchange between Ed and David. It, it, it's not just about the platform, but it's quite specifically about putting the code in the DLL. Uh, I think if they had, had, had uh, uh, thought of the case perhaps at a more granular level than it appeared to me they were thinking of it as. It, it, it might, have been, might have been a different uh, situation. I don't know. But I thought David so, Boyce's oh. comment suggested they were on the granular level and they were losing because uh, it was instead about the morality play. Uh, well, clearly when, you know, when the, when the, the Elchin visual aid thing blew up, I mean, things like that are pretty, uh, uh, you're going <laughs> to... Make it hard to win any case, I suppose. Some, some, uh, but I'm not sure that what David said is necessarily inconsistent with what I said. But I'd have to defer to, to Phil and, and Carmen, the people who were at the trial, to know whether there, whether what I said, which clearly, if there's no question, I think I've accurately described the way the case was pitched to the division pre-complaint. Mm. What I have to be much more agnostic about is how it was tried, because I just wasn't that close to trial. I see. I see. Um, and so, Keith, what do you think the department you know, failed I, to? I think that. Uh, yeah. I think that we tend to um, miss how much luck has played a role in the whole thing. I mean, I think that, that the prosecution was lucky to get Jackson, who I think bought into the morality play of the, of the case. Um, I think there are a number of judges, a Posner or Easterbrook type, who would have been thinking about the economics and not have been so swayed by uh, what people said in emails or things like that. Now, still could have come out the same way, but I think uh, it would have been a tougher case on the part. But this, my opinion is it would have been a tougher case on the government's part, uh, largely because um, you know some of the more economically minded judges would have been thinking about the put a heavier thumb on the false positives problem. Another aspect that I would just sort of point to, sort of in the same context of sort of call it the. Uh, you know, the vagaries or idiosyncrasies of a particular case or process. It was an interesting um, innovation, if you will, to have all of the direct testimony submitted in writing and have all of the cross-examination done in person. Because if you think about trying to evaluate someone's credibility, I actually think it's easier to do it if you first give the person the opportunity to tell their story and you can evaluate the person as he or she is telling the story and then you can evaluate the person as he or she is cross-examined by the other side. Um, you know, so to some degree, um, you know, once the case became a test of credibility, uh, you know, it, it was a, a factor that, you know, all of this knowledge about all of these technical issues were just submitted in writing and not discussed by the people who, you know, were quite passionate and well informed about them. It's, I'm not suggesting the outcome would necessarily have changed, but I actually think that there is a good reason that in most trials, witnesses provide their direct testimony orally rather than in writing. Is that something you guys agree to, or that the judge imposed on you, the no direct testimony live? I don't have a recollection myself. No, it's, uh... Okay. Uh, Frank had wanted to say something? Uh, well, from my perspective, uh, there were several things that Microsoft could have done a lot better. These are not grand things. These are things that involve the way you, you ought to be trying the case. The Alchin videos were, of course, one thing. Somebody should have caught all of the, all those. Um, but uh, Schmalenzi's testimony was another. Uh, the, um, David mentioned earlier this business about Microsoft. Schmalenzi testified that Microsoft had told him they kept, he, they, that they kept their records on little pieces of paper and they couldn't recover uh, the information. Uh, and then we didn't add that Bill Gates came out a week later during the recess in the trial and boasted about the great electronic uh, record-keeping system. Now, somebody blew it. 
there. I don't know, somebody told Schmollensy the wrong story. His staff and then the lawyers failed to check on what seemed to be perfectly preposterous and was in fact perfectly preposterous. That was not the only uh, occasion in which I felt he was being hung out to dry, and unnecessarily so. Ms. Felton. Um, I think it's interesting that Microsoft did not have an outside computer science expert testify for them. Um, I think the decision to try to use their own executives to make that part of the case um, really played out as a mistake. Um, just having someone who had testified before and knew what it was like to be cross-examined, that person probably would have been more careful about the videotape, for example. Um, I also think that an outside expert would have had a different perspective on Microsoft's technology and how it connected to the case that might have helped the, the legal team. Well, they, my, my Microsoft did designate a outside computer scientist expert, and he was taken off the witness list after the dep his deposition, if you recall. So, uh, okay, <laughs> I, I forgot his name, but um, I think they concluded after his deposition that they were better off relying on their own employees. I think that was Mike, Michael Dertuzis That's from right. uh, MIT. I, I just wanted to jump in to try to maybe refine a little of what David said and make sure that I don't think we get too far off track in this idea of the morality play versus the sort of sound economic reasoning. And in a sense, I mean, I got to watch this from a you know fun vantage point. In a sense, the trial had two very different leaders, two people focused on very different things. There was David Boies, the amazing trial lawyer who knew how to convince and how to persuade and how to get the heart of Judge Jackson. And then there was Doug Melamed, who was really the sort of intellectual compass and the sort of conservative, cautious, sound uh, antitrust guy saying, you, look, you can do all sorts of bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, we're going to present a solid case that makes economic sense. And I think those two were absolutely consistent. And I think it's easy to get the idea that, sh you know, sort of flashy trial tactics and gotcha moments uh, filled in gaps where there really wasn't sound economics or sound evidence. And, and I really don't think that's the case. Instead, the credibility idea David was talking about is more you know, you have two versions of the truth. You have two narratives, and, and ours was based on a reading of Microsoft emails and Microsoft documents that didn't just sort of say, go kill the competition, but told a very specific story. The OEM channel is the way we get the browser to customers. They won't use it unless we put it on the machine. We've got to tie them together. And, and so the credibility issue was more, David set it up in the opening. It's, there was a story told in the contemporaneous documents then and there's a different story as a matter of litigation that you might hear in the courtroom now, and you should believe the old one, the contemporaneous one, not the new one. And to me, the credibility was about that. It wasn't about, you know, we got them a few times, you know, they're not being as truthful as they should be, and so forget about the substance, just decide on that. You know, and my sense was the two were really proceeding in parallel, and, and I think Doug would not have let us, and often didn't let us take advantage of maybe cheap shots that didn't have a really solid uh, doctrinal and economic underpinnings. Um, so in terms of the lessons one draws uh, from Microsoft, I wonder, uh, there's a saying that uh, hard cases make bad law. I wonder whether hard cases also make bad lessons. Is this case so unique mm -hmm. that we really shouldn't be drawing big general lessons from it? Or are there big general lessons to be drawn uh, from this case? Uh, Keith, why don't you start? Oh, I get to go. Okay. I had the benefit of going last, and so I could listen to what these guys said and respond. Um, well, uh, well, one lesson was reflected, uh, two lessons were reflected in what David Boyce said in his talk. Um, he said, well, maybe if we could foresee what would happen with the European Union and other foreign competition regimes, we might would have, might have thought about this a little more. Well, we're here today, and you know, uh, maybe this might explain something for the zero, zero, zero pattern that Andy Gavel was talking about for Section 2 um, filings uh, brought today. Um, you know, maybe people, are, maybe people are thinking about the costs of these things um, in terms of, of global reg regulation of firms. Um, so maybe that's, a, that's one kind of harsh lesson that's sitting out there as a result of the case, and people can walk away with their own interpretations of that lesson. Some people might say, well, that just means you go after dominant firms even harder because you know that they'll be, that'll uh, kick off uh, uh, coattail lawsuits, uh, prosecutions in other jurisdictions around the world. Others might say, 
well, you need to be careful because uh, you're going to end up multiplying, you know, the penalties um, by a thousandfold when uh, when you really didn't plan to do that. Um, David also mentioned that went to this story about the decision not to install virus protection, and uh, you know that's all. That's always um, if it's if if Microsoft is hesitant about doing something that's good for consumers because it's afraid about lawsuits. You know, is that, is that a good thing, a good result of Section 2 law? Well, you know, that's open. People can think about that. Um, I, I don't think it, it's a good thing, but maybe people have different opinions about it. Um, interesting article in The Economist a few weeks ago, well, weeks ago about uh, cell phone providers in Mexico and how the government had been concerned about one of the major providers uh, having a dominant market share. And, then, and so that provider kept its prices high to allow rivals to come in and compete. So there you have it, you know, there are real world examples of firms thinking about being punished for their market shares and so they, they back off from competition. That's the perverse of what, that's, that's not what the antitrust laws are supposed to do. They're not supposed to make a dominant firm shy away from competition to avoid lawsuits. Uh, if that's a lesson that we've gotten out of the case, that's another harsh lesson that we should be concerned about. Um, I suppose there, there, there's some good lessons in terms of clarification of the law, but, you know, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on those. Doug? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Chief's comment just reminded me, I had a, a conversation over lunch with Brad, actually, about this when he spoke this morning. One of the things he said that, that I found uh, 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 troubling uh, in connection with the antivirus story uh, was... Um, a kind of description, as I recall him putting it, that, that uh, Microsoft has learned that, it, I think you used the word mature, which is interesting, but Microsoft has learned that, that um, uh, it has responsibilities uh, as, a, as a big company, as a dominant, or at least arguably dominant company that, that lesser companies don't have. And I found that troublesome because, to my lights at least, I think I'm pretty close to U.S. law. Uh, uh, antitrust law ought to be encouraging companies to, to behave in efficient ways, pro ways that enhance welfare. And if they're doing that, it shouldn't matter how big they are or what their market share is. That's permissible conduct uh, and, and uh, it's, it's anti-competitive conduct if it's not efficiency or, or, or pro-competitive enhancing. Um, I think, uh, Brad, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the thrust of what he was saying is that maybe that, maybe that concern comes more from uh, jurisdictions outside the U.S. than from U.S. law. I hope so. So if that's true, then, then the question becomes, um, uh, did, did the Microsoft case unleash the EC in Korea and all? And if so, then you've got to put some concerns about perhaps over deterrence from their activities in the scale of evaluating the pros and cons of this case. But if you assume that, that the Europeans would have figured out about competition law and about Article 82, even without uh, the nudging of, of, of the Microsoft case, which I think is a certainty, actually, uh, then you can focus just on the, Microsoft, the impact of the Microsoft case within the U.S. on U.S. law and so forth. And there, I think, it's had a pretty salutary effect because I think um, it gave life to what had previously been thought to be a kind of a uh, artifact of the, of the distant past, Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, except when used for uh, by plight of strike suitors. But it, it, gave, it gave life to it in a, in, in a sensible, I think doctrinally sound case that won the unanimous support of a very conservative Republican uh, D.C. circuit. Certainly Judges Williams and uh, and Ginsburg had a heavy, heavy hand in, particularly Ginsburg, I suspect, in that in that opinion. And no one would accuse them of being, uh, being, uh, you know, on the, on the left two thirds of the political spectrum. Um, uh, so I think it was a sound case. And I think also, as David Boyce said earlier, it was done in in a, in a, in a time frame that was meaningful. Uh, it wasn't like the IBM case that dragged on like uh, Jarndyce versus Jarndyce. So um, I think in those senses, uh, uh, because it gave life to Section 2 in a doctrinally sound way, uh, uh, elicited a, an opinion that's in some ways a template or a roadmap for future cases out of the D.C. Circuit and did it in a, in a, in a uh, sensible amount of time, uh, I'd have to say it was a, it was a success. Brad? Well, I think the case has lots of lessons and if anything, the challenge is how to distill them because there are so many that one could talk about. And I, I think Doug and Keith have touched upon a number of them. 
one can start with the narrow and then I, I think go progressively more broadly. Certainly the case has a lot of lessons about how to try a case and win it. Uh, I, I think that, I thought that David's talk this afternoon illuminated that very well. You know, this basic concept that to, to win a trial, uh, you've got to be able to take something that's complicated and figure out how to simplify it. You have to figure out how to synthesize the technical complexities with a very human story, because ultimately every trial is also a story. And yeah, I, I think there's a lot, you know, looking back, to ad admire it uh, in the effectiveness uh, of the case that the government put on in terms of the way it tried the case. Uh, I think that one can look at the case as a lesson of government intervention um, designed to advance some particular positions and move them forward. Um, I was quite struck by the point that, that uh, Doug made this morning about network effects. And I, I think it is quite valid um, to think about the fact that network effects were not as well understood, um, were not as thoroughly embraced. Uh, in the legal and policy community prior to this case. Uh, and yet, I think a decade later, they are much more thoroughly understood by a broader circle, and they should be, um, because they do play a very, very important role economically, uh, especially when we're talking about the kinds of phenomenon that we see unfold on the web. Um, I think there are certainly lessons that one can glean for international and global interaction in either because in some cases things worked or in this case you know perhaps because they they didn't but there are nonetheless some important lessons to be drawn Doug is 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 right in that I was pointing to in part uh, the degree to which European law really does impose more limitations uh, on companies that have a dominant position, which is typically defined as having something on the order of a 30% market share, uh, you know, and you know, does take a different orientation uh, than U.S. law traditionally has done, and Andy was talking about that a bit before. I will say, though, in addition to that, I have been struck many, many times over the last decade by the number of times I have had conversations with companies in our industry in Silicon Valley, and I've talked about antitrust law. And I have often been met, I have felt, with a reaction that antitrust law is something that is applicable to Microsoft. It's not applicable to us. And you know, perhaps there's a variety of reasons to uh, account for that. Um, but I do think that there was a mistake that we made that may be re being repeated by others. When you live in an industry that is so dynamic, you constantly feel vulnerable. Andy Grove described it in his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. And I think it's quite possible for people in the industry to feel that they are never going to be subject to Section 2 because they're not Microsoft. And yet, you know, Section 2 doesn't refer to the word Microsoft. And yeah, I think that there are some, some broader aspects there that it will be interesting to see uh, you know, as the law continues to evolve and as our, our industry continues to evolve, how more companies really think about these principles. So uh, one thing Doug mentioned was that the decision did, uh, you know, finding liability, what included the most conservative judges um, on the D.C. Circuit, including very sophisticated antitrust uh, judges. Um, and I wonder, could, do you think the judgment could be sustained under the new Department of Justice report standard uh, or not? Or would that standard uh, dictate not bringing such a case or not finding liability? Uh, I think it could be, well, I, you know, I, You'd have to fly spec it more than I've done, but I think the answer is yes, it could be sustained um, uh, in part because uh, at almost all of the most um, conservative, if that's the right word, points in the decision, uh, there were sort of fudge words, even refusals to deal, you know, refu unilateral refusals to deal will not 
be in what would it, will not figure importantly or something like that in antitrust enforcement. They never slammed the door shut. And so I think a case that was grounded as this was in fact findings that the Court of Appeals affirmed that there was no uh, a, a legitimate justification for this conduct and so forth, uh, I think, I think uh, could be reconciled with, with the Section 2 report. However, I think um, uh, a Justice Department that, that would write such a report would not have brought that case. Well, but uh, <laughs> although there's, uh, they said there's no justification, the anti-competitive effect was also sort of futuristic, right? There was a notion that Netscape would be a good platform for applications in the future. So how do you have a disproportionate anti-competitive effect to the pro-competitive justification? So it has to be substantially disproportionate. Well, you, you, you only get to disproportionate. You only have to prove a disproportionate effect if you if there's a, a benefit to put in the balance, and if you find no benefit, as as the, as the courts did on almost all of the conduct uh, challenged by the government, then you don't have to get to the disproportionality test. Um, but let me just expand for a minute, because again, it goes to other things on my mind a little bit. Um, this, uh, uh, the causation injury to competition component of this, of, of this opinion, which is, I think, quite interesting, in which um, some people, uh, uh, from a plaintiff's perspective, have read very broadly to say all you have to do to, to satisfy the injury to competition element uh, in, in a Section 2 case generally is to identify conduct that has the potential to injure competition, which seems to me means all you have to do is find anti-competitive conduct and you've written the second element out of the offense. I don't think that's what the opinion actually means because this was a monopoly maintenance case. The theory of the case was that Microsoft's anti-competitive conduct had raised entry barriers, uh, the, or, or put differently, had reduced the probability of entry in the future. And in a case with that theory, it was perfectly appropriate, I think, for the court to say um, the theory of the case was it raised, it reduced the probability of entry to an incumbent monopoly. We, of course, don't know what would happen, uh, uh, what would have happened if those entry barriers hadn't been raised, but we shouldn't have to prove that in a monopoly maintenance case. That's very different from saying in, for example, a, 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 an obtaining monopoly case that you don't have to prove uh, that there's a causal connection between the conduct uh, and the creation of the monopoly. Keith, what do you think? Uh, I'd, first, I guess I'd go back to my statement about luck and, luck and chance that so uh, Judge Jackson bought into the morality play view and not all district court judges would have been, uh, would have been inclined to do so. Um, so the prosecution was lucky in that sense. And then Jackson also tried to immunize the case against reversal by making it so heavily fact-bound. Um, so it could be that that very conservative set of judges who were looking at the case on appeal were constrained uh, to a large extent by Judge Jackson's opinion, uh, which was, um, everyone knows it's a, it's a long opinion, pointing to all sorts of mm -hmm. things that went on. Um, so uh, the fact that you brought up, so I know you brought up that it's a set of conservative judges. Well, those conservative judges, I thought, I think found themselves pretty severely constrained by the mm -hmm. opinion that, that Jackson had given them to work with. Um, but, had but said things been different at the trial court level, yeah. that maybe there would have been, uh, and, and, and I think there's actually a high probability, or, or, or substantial, put it this way, a substantial probability that things would have gone differently at the trial court level uh, if they had a, a different judge of the sort that I'm talking about. Um, now, your, your, I think your question also was, would, um, would we see this kind of case under the current uh, Department of Justice? And I kind of agree with, with unless I'm missing the question. Uh, I mean, under the standard, uh, say a neutral person applying <laughs> the standard, <laughs> okay. not, yeah, not the current Department of Justice uh, yeah. applying the zero uh, cases standard. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. assume somebody's just saying, this right. is a standard we have, right. would it apply? Well, right. uh, so if, yeah. if, I, if, I buy, if I buy what the appellate court said about Microsoft's, about the, uh, in re with respect to the specific acts that were found to be anti-competitive, then yeah, it looks like it could be a case that they would bring today because they're saying, well, there's an anti-competitive effect and no pro-competitive justification whatsoever. Of course, the cre question that raises is just, you know, what happened to the pro-competitive justifications? Because Brad has said, well, you know, I'm sure they were offered. And Doug has said, well, he could think of some in his sleep. No, no, I thought of some, I thought of some, oh, sorry, let me just, yeah. I, I thought of some 
Two, I mean, I could offer some pro-competitive justifications for almost, you know, it could pretty much go down the list and maybe there might be one or two things that I couldn't try to explain on efficiency grounds, but then there'd be a whole lot that I think I could come up with not knowing anything about how the firm works. Um, so it strikes me that, there, that something happened, that there were pro-competitive justifications that I assume someone must have been thinking about or must have been there that didn't make, it, didn't make their way. And if that's the case, if there were pro-competitive, you know, serious pro-competitive justifications or efficiency justifications, then it's a much, much more difficult case. And, and then I don't know if it would be brought by a, a neutral person mm -hmm. today working under the guidelines that, that have been issued by right. the Department of Justice. I want to clarify what I intended to say earlier, and I have a hunch it's actually what you mean to say too, but, I, but if, we'll and it's, uh, um, it is not that I know what the efficiency justifications were for this conduct. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm perfectly willing to accept the findings of the court that there were none. What I meant to say was it's easy to think of the types of arguments you would make or the types of rationales that might justify these kinds of conduct. Uh, but if the facts don't support them, then I assume that they, they, the conduct, in fact, wasn't uh, uh, pro-competitive. Yeah, I guess one, one question is, are there any set of facts that could support, you know, some plausible efficiency justification? And, and I think that's probably true in that case. Brad, do you think you win under the current uh, Department of Justice report standard? I, I'm not prepared to hazard a prediction on that, but I will offer a couple of thoughts. I, I do think it's worthwhile to just think about the fact that we often use this phrase, Section 2 and unilateral conduct. But at times what is being tested under Section 2 is not completely unilateral. If you look at the, the, the 12 acts that w the Court of Appeals found in the Microsoft case to have constituted unlawful conduct, two-thirds of them uh, involved provisions in agreements with other companies. You know, so it, it was bilateral, at least in that sense. It's not that the second company violated the law, but they were provisions in agreements. And you know, I, I just find in general that uh, in thinking about the application of this area of the law to the business activities of companies, um, you know, it's a lot easier to figure out what the law is likely to require, and it's a lot easier to apply it um, when it's clear that there are certain types of contractual provisions that need to be avoided. And indeed, that's what the judgment uh, reflects to some degree. There's a number of types of provisions that need to be avoided. Um, where I get more nervous is when we're talking about software development activities that is genuinely quite unilateral and quite technical. You know, I respect Ed's opinions a lot, and you know, I find it interesting you know, when he says, well, gee, we should have taken the same code and put it into two DLL files instead of one. And if, even if I accept that premise, I will admit it makes me really nervous to think that it's the, the job of lawyers to be sitting next to engineers saying, this is the way you should put your code into your files. And you know, so I'm not trying to uh, you know, pick a, 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 an argument, if you will, over that particular issue at that particular time, but I, I do think that the law in general can be more easily applied with respect to some kinds of, of practices than it can be with respect to others. Yes, you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I wanted to respond on that, that essentially I think that the reason for the commingling of code was that there was a business person informed by a lawyer who told the engineers to commingle the code in order to satisfy the in parentheses provided however from the that we saw earlier that says essentially that you can integrate things. And so I think it doesn't make any sense to say that you can't look at that conduct, which was essentially a business judgment based on an attempt to take a certain legal position. Well, all, all I can say is at the time this code was created, we didn't have enough lawyers to do that kind of thing. <laughs> it just wasn't, it's just not a possibility. Dave Heider was our first antitrust lawyer who, who by the way, joined the company after Windows 95 went out the door. So, 
I, I just don't think that was in fact the way things unfolded in reality. Um, so, uh, Brad, there's a question hanging from earlier I want to give you a chance to respond to, uh, which was, what was Steve Ballmer and Vice President Cheney talking about? Uh, <laughs> no, no, <clears throat> I turned everybody and go, I didn't know Steve met with Dick Cheney in 2001. And uh, you know, I, I turned to our other folks, I asked Dave Heiner, did, 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 did he meet with Dick Cheney in 2001? And Dave said, I thought you would know. So, uh, but I did ask John Wilkie, and, 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 and you know, there were people who said, well, there actually was a press report at the time uh, that said that, uh, that Steve was going in and there, there was a pre-arranged uh, understanding that was announced by the White House that there would be no discussion of the case. Um, so I, I, now I'm just repeating what was told to me by the reporter. So I, I have no direct knowledge of that myself. I, I've never, you know, I don't recall ever hearing about the meeting. So I, I will say I don't think it was anything of any lasting importance. All right. <laughs> Uh, there's lots of issues to talk about. Yeah. Uh, and there was this other s suggestion made that three senators got their talking points from uh, Microsoft. Uh, you want to respond to that? I don't know the specifics, but look, we, we, we answer questions from members of Congress. We provide suggestions to members of Congress. You know, if something was said on March 24th, uh, you know, 2004, everybody knew for a week that the European Commission was going to uh, issue its decision that day. Commissioner Monti announced on, on March 17th that they were going to do so. So it, it certainly wouldn't have surprised me if some of our folks uh, were up on the hill talking about the decision that we all knew was about to be issued. All right. Um, David Boyce's talk, uh, why shouldn't it be deeply disturbing? Uh, that is, kind of when we talk about our political process, it seems to me people decry the fact that instead of talking about health care policy and how to regulate subprime mortgages, it's all about putting lipstick on pigs and how many houses does McCain have. It's all these sort of gotcha stuff, character stuff, rather than the merits. Um, so why isn't this a, uh, a profound indictment of our trial process uh, rather than something to uh, celebrate or bemusedly uh, talk about and uh, draw. I mean, shouldn't the, what, should the lesson be we should really change uh, the trial process um, or at least perhaps at least um, a, have court appointed experts uh, to help assess uh, testimony in all these cases? Well, you really ought to be asking, you know, trial experts, uh, but, um, but he left, so I can't <laughs> ask him. <laughs> well, there are others in this room. Uh, I, uh, I did not take David's state, uh, 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 in, very interesting talk to mean necessarily, or even, even that he necessarily meant probably, that, um, that these morality plays lead to wrong results. Uh, and I think following up on what Phil said a, a, a while ago, you know, if a witness is tripped up because he, he referred to, you know, he, the brown shoes he's wearing, he's wearing black shoes, it's not going to make an, an impression on the fact finder, I assume. But if he's tripped up with something that's germane to the case, uh, it, while it might not literally prove, you know, the, the, the Alchin tape blowing up may not prove that what the tape purported to show didn't, you know, couldn't have been shown by a proper tape. Uh, but over the mass of cases, it may well be that those kinds of morality plays correlate very strongly positively, not randomly or negatively, with the underlying truth you're trying to get at. And I just, I'm not sure that David meant to say that that, that, it, that, that, that morality plays theme he was talking about means that trials are random events at all. No, I agree. He wasn't trying to say that, but I wonder, we, I, we wouldn't have the same reaction for Pollux, I don't think. Or maybe we would. Maybe we'd say that all these character points, uh, you know, you have, instead of a jury, you have an electorate. They're not sure who's right about complicated questions like health care. So the best way to trade off and figure out who's likely to be right is figuring out who's got a character who seems to share their values about hockey moms or uh, 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 pigs and lipstick or are they di divorced from reality by having too many houses. Uh, I suppose you could have the same kind of justification for that uh, as well, couldn't you? Well, if you look at the consistency with which elected officials implement their campaign promises, 
one might argue that gut checks are in fact a better way to pick them than, than their platforms. Uh, I mean, it's the same question. I don't know what the answer is, but it seems to me it's not self-evident that technocrats are necessarily going to do a better job. All right. Hey, Frank has his hand up. Wait, wait, no. Brad? Yeah. You want to put on your microphone? Wow. Sorry. You want to throw things at me. <laughs> um, I'd like to say something about the suggestion about court-appointed experts uh, in these matters. I think there's a real problem there. I've been in such cases. Uh, but I want to tell you of a conversation I once had with Judge Wysansky, uh who, of course, was the, as it were, the, the father of using an economist as a court-appointed expert. Uh, and I once asked him, this is a long time ago now, of course, he's been dead for a long time, and I don't, didn't go to a medium to ask this question, but um, I asked him whether the experiment that he had with Carl Cajun had ever been repeated. And to my great surprise, he replied, no, and it never should be. And this, I thought that was regarded as a great success. I asked him why. And he said, because he thought that although he, Wysansky, was very tough, it could be said that uh, the setup was such that uh, Carl had had too much power in the case. So I asked him, what would you do? And he said, well, I would get a court-appointed expert and uh, have the party's experts testify in front of him and then have him uh, submit a report, and that report would be subject to cross-examination by the parties in front of the judge. But now we come to the problem. I said, has it ever been tried? He said, well, it was tried once in a, parent, in a patent case in Arizona. And um, I said, and what was the result? He said, we don't know. The parties found the, ex the court experts' report so sensible that they settled immediately on the basis of it. <laughs> uh, and I can certainly recall being in a case in which there was a court-appointed e expert, uh, Dan Rubenfeld, uh, who gave perfectly intel. There was a lot, there was a lot of, by the way, of gamesmanship about suggesting who should be appointed as a court expert and so forth. But in the end, the court appointed a perfectly good one. And um, the parties declined to cross-examine him. Uh, I don't know what the other side thought, but my, the side I was on certainly thought we didn't want to, we didn't want to annoy the judge by cross-examining her pet. Uh, so it's, it's not a simple matter. I, I would just say that you know, we, we ha and handle litigation in roughly 80 to 100 countries every year. So we get the opportunity to experience all kinds of systems. Ha happily, most of these are cases that we bring ourselves against piracy or, or counterfeiting. Um, no system is perfect, but I would much rather have our system than any other that we have seen. I would much rather have a case decided by a judge who's appointed to lifetime tenure under Article III of the Constitution, who's genuinely independent of the executive branch, who hopefully is given a sufficiently attractive salary to be attracted to the bench and to stay there for his or her career. And I think that it, in fact, is better than anything I've ever seen even to have a generalist who is going to have to grapple with specialized knowledge. I think David's point was, was really quite on the mark in terms of the pitfalls of specialist courts. And it doesn't mean we should never have them. I'm not suggesting that it's a mistake to have the federal circuit. But I just don't think it's feasible to construct so many of them that we just go to specialist court after specialist court. By definition, when you're making your case to a generalist, or when you're acting as a generalist, I mean, I'm a general counsel, and this is what general counsels have to do, you, know, you have to sit down with people who know more about the subject than you do. You have to learn everything that you can that you think you need to understand in order to make a decision. It is important to test, to assess, whether the people who are talking to you really understand what they're talking about. Um, it is absolutely appropriate in these kinds of cases to assess their credibility. And then you need to make a decision with the kinds of breadth of perspective that hopefully you've been put into the position or onto the bench to apply. It's not a system that is devoid of errors or, or warts. And even when it's disappointing to lose, I'd rather lose under that system 
maybe I might like to win under some others too, <laughs> but I'd still rather have the chance to win the next case under the same system. All right, um, before I open up the floor to questions, uh, Keith, do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, I'll pass on that. <laughs> okay, uh, so any, any other questions for our panel? Yeah, I, I was interested in the discussion that came when we talked about whether or not the case was a success and what the lessons were. And it sounded like we were evaluating things about, you know, how clean the doctrine was or how well we educated the public. And uh, that kind of concerns me because it seems to me that what we're looking at here at heart is a government policy decision to intervene in an industry. And antitrust law was just a tool that it used. So the only ex post justification has to be when we look at the way that innovation and product development has come in the software and internet industries and maybe in the broader tech sector. As Frank pointed out this morning, it's followed a different pattern, and I would say significantly different pattern, from the one that would have prevailed had the government never brought the case. And so the ultimate question of success or failure has to be, do we believe that we have healthier industries now than we would have otherwise? And, and everything else is just sort of secondary. I'm, I'm going to leave in about two minutes, so I'm going to jump ahead and answer this question first. And uh, I, I don't agree with your statement of what the important question is. There was no doubt in, in our, at least in, in, in the Justice Department side of it, we talked about it in these terms, that this case was about two problems. The Microsoft problem, which is a shorthand for what you're talking about, and the antitrust problem, uh, which is the issue of the, the, the suitability of antitrust, the doctrine, it's, you know, attractability for, for the real world. Um, and, and now I, I will tell you that, that not everyone would, on, on the Justice Department would agree with what I'm about to say, but, but uh, my view is that the antitrust problem was the more important problem. And the reason for that is this. There are a handful of cases each year that are the subject of government investigation, even in the, you know, the Democratic years in that chart that was up here, and maybe uh, two handfuls that are the subject of private litigation. But there are millions of decisions that businesses take every day around the country. Um, and the really important contribution of antitrust law to the economy, it comes, I think, from the signals it sends to the business community. Not just the people making soft software or internet products, but people making you know, automobiles and widgets and, and, and whatever. Um, and if we don't get the doctrine right, and couple it with procedures that enable us to have enough confidence in the accuracy of the decision so that, so that it doesn't turn into kind of a random, you know, a random shooting or something. Um, we're going to be sending the wrong signals to the economy. So uh, I do think that, that getting the doctrine right is ultimately more important, although I agree, particularly in an industry of this, of this magnitude and this importance to our economy, that other question is an important one as well. Harry? Yes, I agree. <laughs> Should I just go ahead and... Boy, I wish David Boyd were here. Now, wasn't that effective? <laughs> Should I pick up on that? Yes. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think the message is don't settle because, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Doug just said. I think that um, if, if you take the, the lawyerly view of what, what's coming out of court cases, you know, you're getting these rules that signals to people about how to conduct their affairs. And you're weaving this kind of fabric of rules, and you'd like the courts to do that in a way that gets it right. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you never settle, because sometimes you may get that fabric at a point where it's pretty good, and you don't want cases coming in there and messing it up then, because then you can get distorted signals, and, and it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't help. So, uh, so that's one way of viewing. Lawyers tend, to, and, you know, lawyers tend to look at everything in terms of, are we getting the right signals out of it? And then there's the other way of viewing uh, law and trials just on the operational question, well, you know, is the economy ending up, is social welfare higher as a result? And I think 
most people who aren't lawyers would ask that question. Are we had social welfare higher as a result mm -hmm. of, of this case or that case? Whereas, you know, lawyer, lawyers, myself included, you know, sort of ask this question of are, is, are the rules, the sort of uh, fabric of rules that are coming out, is that, a, is that a good fabric coming out and are the courts doing a good job of maintaining it? Uh, Judge Boudin? It seems to me that, that uh, in some ways cases like Microsoft or IBM or Standard Oil uh, are, really have to be viewed in a different way. It isn't, I mean, the doc doctrine might come out of it that looks good or doesn't look good. Um, signals might come out of it that look good or don't. But in some ways they're about a phenomenon that's concerned the public, the business community. They're huge. Uh, uh, the oil industry, the computer industry, the, uh, uh, they're sort of phenomenon of their own. They're not ordinary cases. They're reactions to a situation. The doctrine will get changed. People should, shouldn't have such touching faith in the notion that the judges are going to do this, f follow this rule in the next case. They're trying to solve an enormous problem, or at least it seems enormous to them. In some ways, either to talk about the <laughs> The doctrine or the message generally, uh, it would be better in a way to have a historian, an economic historian, talking about this modest, modest in number, subset of cases about which you have conferences like this. Uh, what I'm saying is I don't, the, the, the public, the senators, the Justice Department officials, the business people who are complaining or supporting are all reacting to an enormous event that's happened, a dominant company, there aren't that many dominant companies in big industries anymore, that, that has excited everyone. It's the railroads in the, in, the 18, in the 1880s and 90s, it was IBM, and a later period it was AT&T, at a period, and they're trying to solve a practical, or what they perceive to be a practical problem. And in some ways, you know, <laughs> trying to treat these as points on a graph that's not really the way the people who are immersed in them think about them, and it may not even be their main significance. The fact that AT&T was completely reorganized, that the Standard Oil Company was broken up, that Microsoft was not probably not greatly altered, but maybe to some extent, those are sort of the, the, the lessons of the cases. I mean, the... the um, it seems to me it wasn't a legal lesson. The case didn't come to a substantive conclusion with an outcome that was dictated by the lawyers. The, well, the, the economy took... Well, but some cases have results where you get a decree and you get an enormous change. Some have, have no outcome or they have decrees where you don't get very much of a change. I'm just saying that the, these cases aren't like other cases in some ways. Their importance it's not idiosyncratic, but it, it, it lies in the event. And while IBM, the, the economy took care of it, maybe it never should have been brought. Mm -hmm. But uh, AT&T, on the other hand, has changed the whole, uh, the, the, the whole world. And I, 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 that's about all I'd say. You so, need a historian. Uh, I mean, in support of that, I guess I would say the fact that the judgment actually announced a tying doctrine unique to the computer industry suggests a pretty industry-specific uh, approach. But then what really was the effect of the case? Because if it's not broad doctrinal change, in the end, Internet Explorer dominated, uh, still largely sold with the operating system despite these uh, restrictions. Um, so uh, if you take an industry-specific uh, approach, what's really the upshot? Well, the one thing I would say, and, I, and there, there are certain things in what Judge Boudin says that I agree with, and then I, there are other things that probably give me a little pause because um, you know there may be aspects about this kind of case that are unusual. Um, personally, I I tend to think that there's not much, and I hope there's not much that is genuinely unique uh, because you know the, the, to some degree the whole concept of having a system of laws is is having principles that are going to be applied um, in other instances where other companies in this context are similarly situated. Um, now the interesting thing when you get to our sector 
is that the information technology industry has quite a number of companies that have quite a high market share. Now, one can debate how do you define the market, but here in 2008, IBM sells 100% of the world's mainframe computers, on which there is stored 70% of the government's data around the world. And you know, Frank or others can say yes, but servers compete with them, and maybe they do, but you know, there is no other company that builds and sells mainframe computers today. There's only one company that, for all practical purposes, makes a portable document format, the Adobe PDF. You know, we, we've tried, but I think you know, Adobe has somewhere between 99 and 100 percent of the share, and there's enormous network effects associated with that. Uh, Google you know, has 60-odd percent of the, uh, the search share in the United States. It has over 90 percent of the search share in Europe. It has over 70 percent of the uh, market share for paid search advertisements here in the United States and even higher percentage elsewhere and there's enormous network effects associated with that. Uh, and I could go on and on and we'd run out of time and you'd fall asleep. But you know, there are a lot of companies in our industry that have a high market share in certain product categories and if you were to look at their internal documents, I think what you would find is they would have percentages that in many instances were in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. Can I, uh, if, uh, I'd like to follow up on, on Judge Boudin's comment that, well, these, these cases are solving perceived social problems. You know, these are gigantic problems that uh, everyone feels we need to do something about. And I, I guess I, I, re I sort of, I'd like to resist that view. I'd like to take a more boring view of antitrust law because of that view generates to me some of the some of the more worrisome parts of the law that people who you know the squeaking wheel gets the squeaking wheel noisy wheel gets the oil or something like that that people who just make noise that interest groups who push the government enforcement agencies to act those are the ones that's the places where we'll see uh, enforcement uh, people who have government connections you know they're better off than people who aren't I think that's the danger in I mean that's that's I guess that's the reason why I'm, I'm kind of resistant to that view of what antitrust law is doing under Section 2. All right, new, Harry? Well, I, I want to agree with Judge Boudin and Doug. If you were here. Can you use your mic, uh, please, Harry? Sorry. I, w I want to agree with Judge, B Judge Boudin and with Doug if he were here, because um, I, I'm sure that Doug would say, I never brought this case because it's some great social confluence of something. I brought it because or we brought it, or the Justice Department brought it, because there were these anti-competitive acts and, you know, it was a good legal case. But as you look back on it, I mean, it's really striking when you think about the conference for a day and a half. Um, there is something else here. It didn't trigger the case. It, it happened around the case because of the company that Microsoft certainly was at the time, and in some ways may still be. But. Um, there, there was another aspect to it, which you don't see until maybe afterwards. Um, uh, that's, that's historic in taking on um, a really dominant firm uh, with, you know, long-term monopoly power. Um, I don't think, I don't think um, lawyers making an enforcement decision, or I certainly don't think in this case, said, ah, you know, let's, let's look and see what's the biggest, you know, monopoly that's durable and let's go after it. Um, maybe they did in Alcoa, but we can't ask Thurman Arnold because he's dead. Um, but um, I don't think now that that's the way the decisions are being made. But there is something different about this case. It's hard to maybe put your finger on it completely and it does keep people interested in it. Hopefully interested enough to you know, continue to buy books about it. <laughs> <laughs> but then Andy's not here, so. Uh, I, uh, one of the interesting impacts and maybe an unintended consequence based on what Brad just said is it's turned Microsoft into an ardent advocate of Section 2 enforcement, um, you know, at least in uh, other, other areas of uh, the software business. I you know, think that's a probably good development. Uh, yeah, no, I look, I believe firmly that we should all in our industry be held accountable to follow the same rules at least if we are in a similar situation. And I believe that is the fair thing to do, and certainly as 
an employee of one of the companies. I, I think that you know, it's one thing to be in an industry where everybody has to follow the same rules. You certainly don't want to be the only company in an industry that has to follow a certain set of rules. Um, just to build on that, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I thought this conference was extremely timely also because uh, it's going to happen probably in, uh, <coughs> with about uh, two weeks, uh, right, until we have uh, a decision in the, or some kind of recommendation in the uh, Google Yahoo uh, matter by the Department of Justice. And uh, there is a certain element of deja vu that, that uh, may be characterizing that. And the situation is very, very different among a number of dimensions. But uh, the question that I had was essentially what, um, what lessons do we have out of what's happened here uh, that we can apply as advice either to Google or to the Department of Justice moving forward? Well, I'll. I'll you know, we, 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 you know, we, we, we've been quite direct in sharing our views about the meaning and implications of that agreement. And you know, I think it's important to recognize it's not a case that is about innovation. It's not about you know, how one designs and delivers a service. It is about one thing and one thing only. Whether the number one company in a market sector, a company that has 70% market share, can enter into an agreement with the number two mark company in that market, a company that has 20% share, for the express purpose of, in effect, setting a floor on prices, so that every time the number two company is not able to command a price for its advertisements as high as the number one company, it can send those ads over to the number one company instead and get a higher price out of advertisers. And the agreement was done by the number one company for one reason and one reason only, to prevent the number two company from doing something in collaboration with the number three company that by every account would have made the market more competitive. And in a lot of ways, to me, this is the kind of case that I think should be relatively easy to address. We're not talking about interfering with you know, the course of, of technology. I've often been struck by a, a, an article that was written by an economic historian in the 1970s looking back at Standard Oil and U.S. Steel and the experiences that they had first when Standard Oil was broken up and then when U, U.S. Steel was not. And basically what the, the historian found was how different their experiences had been. Standard Oil had competed too hard, and it was broken up as a result. U.S. Steel saw what had happened to Standard Oil. And so when they got a, a, a new CEO shortly thereafter, he, he, he drove the company's work in a different direction. And when a U.S. Steel case went before the FTC in the 1920s, 220 witnesses from the steel industry testified, all from competitors, all in U.S. Steel's favor. Because the industry, in effect, had gotten so cozy that everybody was comfortable, all of these competitors were entering into agreements with each other that no one wanted to complain. And it actually sort of worked for the U.S. Steel industry until the 1960s when the industry globalized, at which point the U.S. steel industry was far less competitive than the steel industry in the rest of the world. What does that mean when you put all of these things together? I will say there is nothing more dangerous to competition than the number one company trying to elbow out the number three company by helping the number two company raise its prices. So Keith, what do you think about the Google, uh, Yahoo I, deal? I, and I probably shouldn't touch that one because Brad has uh, pretty strong opinions <laughs> and, and has, uh, and has uh, stated them uh, pretty clearly. Um, you know, from the, you know, sitting in the sidelines, it did, it did look, the timing looked strange. Um, and given that, there, that Microsoft, you know, publicly announced the purpose and the theory behind this merger, um, so I, I guess, you know, maybe I shouldn't say more than that because, uh, uh, I don't want to be seen as supporting Brad's case here. <laughs> if anything, just take a different... That would be very unsettling. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a prediction about what the Department of Justice will do? Oh, uh, 
No, I, I, I won't offer any, any prediction on that. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for one last question if people have one. Or if not, we can just end a couple of minutes early. So thank you very much, everybody, for our panelists. And thank you very much, Einer, Brad, and, and Keith. Fabulous panel. I can't think of a better way to end. Uh, and as we wrap up, let me just say thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging in there through all of this. Thanks for really participating and engaging with everything that we're talking about. And a special thanks to all of our panelists, people who took the time to really prepare and get up here and share ideas with us. A special thanks to Brad, Dave, all of the folks from Microsoft who were such good sports that when I know at times are difficult subjects, um, we couldn't have done this. This wouldn't have been a meaningful, real discussion, conversation, debate uh, without you. So we really appreciate you making that possible. Uh, and maybe we'll see you all here 10 years from now when we're looking back on the 20th uh, retrospective to think about what it means at that point. So thank you again. <laughs>